Okay. And we're live. Uh, greetings to our audience. I'm Ed Stalder with the Business Maverick. And Johan Puri is with me today to discuss um, his book, Our Long Walk to Economic Freedom, Lessons from 100,000 Years of Human History. Thanks. Um, so, uh, Johan, how are you today? I'm great, Ed. Thanks for having me here. Yeah, great. Cool, cool. Thank you very much. I just want to say a couple of things. One is um, the book is available uh, for sale. Um, I, I think that the uh, uh, people who are participating in the webinar today can can order it, and um, it will be delivered for free is my understanding. So I'm just going to put that out there right off the bat. And as we move along here, I'm going to move into questions. Um, so as I said in my review, um, this is history as it should be. I find it in, in engaging and accessible, and, and it's it's really kind of a nice romp to 100,000 years of economic history. Can I ask what prompted you to write the book? Sure, yeah. I, I guess there are, um, there are two reasons. Uh, the first is that uh, it was COVID and lockdown, and so at the time, my students, who, who I've been teaching for the last decade uh, in economic history, um, they, uh, of course, couldn't come to class anymore, and so we we uh, decided that I would write out the lectures and and send it to them. And by the end of hard lockdown, I had written about sixteen chapters, and then realized that actually the audience might not be limited to uh, only the eighty students in the class, but but might actually uh, find a wider appeal. And so um, so then I you know commit, uh, I sent the the book or the manuscript to to a couple of publishers and and fortunately Tafelberg uh, responded, um, but that's I guess a kind of quite a, a practical reason. I guess the more substantive reason is that um, I've been teaching this course for uh, for a decade, and um, I've noticed that students are increasingly kind of pessimistic uh, about their place in history uh, and certainly about the future. Um, and so I thought it's it's important to kind of get the message across that actually we are uh, in an, an incredible time, in a remarkable time actually in human history. And even though you know we kind of bombarded by negative news uh, every day, um, in fact our lives are, are certainly much better than our you know ancestors, or even if you go back just two or three generations ago. Um, so it's not to say that you know there's no legitimate reason for for students that are. Uh, you know, unhappy about the situation in South Africa. Of course, we should keep in mind that you know they can hardly first years they can hardly remember the 2010 World Cup. Um, so, so they've really only experienced South Africa in the last uh, decade, and that's of course not necessarily a kind of a positive story. Um, so, so one understands their kind of pessimism, but I thought it's important to kind of you know provide a bigger picture. Right, and it's true right, what you say. I mean, most of hu most of humanity today. That is better than it did a hundred years ago, and things like that. I'm just wondering, just because you kind of raised that topic, um, do, when when people do see a decline in living standards, for example, which you've seen among uh, segments of the working class in the United States and places like that the mm -hmm. past few decades, um, what kind of a um, what kind of social discontent can 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 that kind of stir? Yeah. Yeah, no, that's an excellent observation. And of course, there are, you know, it's not that inevitably things will go up, right? So it's not like some linear trajectory, you know, to infinity. Um, things can go badly wrong. And actually, there's a couple of chapters in the book which which talks about places that have actually experienced declines in uh, per capita income. And and of course, what you referred to is groups within society that could that could experience that. And and you're right that you know the kind of middle middle class in the U.S. have been struggling, um, uh, certainly in the last two or three decades, and and there are several consequences of that. I think kind of the more the shift towards more populist uh, ideas, um, uh, you know, one could connect that to Trump. Uh, certainly in, in Europe, that's been connected by you know great great research have shown that certainly there is a shift towards the right um, uh, and more kind of nationalistic ideas. But also things like opioid use in in the U.S. Um, right. and 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 then the kind of consequence for living standards in that case. So you will actually not only see a decline in income, but you also see a decline in life expectancy, which is you know un, un kind of heard of almost. Um, so it's not just that there are these extreme cases, uh, you know the kind of classic 
I guess, example is, is Zimbabwe or, or if you want to go to Latin America, Venezuela, it could also be in a country that, um, you know, with an with average uh, increase in, in income, you could see subsections of the society that, that are in decline. And then, I mean, that raises really interesting policy questions that, you know, we, we can go into. But, but certainly, I think that's, it's not an inevitability that things must go up. Um, um, so that's certainly, that's certainly true. Okay. And then if I can ask, um, in terms of, just on that topic then, in terms of South Africa, how fertile is the ground here for the, for the EFF, for example, to um, make significant uh, inroads? Or perhaps, um, you know, one of the political parties that has got kind of a, a theological base. Yeah, I, you know, I, I'm not a political scientist, so I'll keep the answer short. I, I think there's always fertile ground for um, more kind of uh, populist rhetoric um, when things go bad. Um, but it's also not a it's not a clear cut case, right? So one should keep in mind that uh, our the shift within the ANC towards more populist policies came in 2008, 2009, actually just on the back of an amazing period of economic growth. In 1948, when the National Party was elected, uh, or the purified National Party was elected into power, and, and we obviously have the introduction of the apartheid policies, that came after 15 years of amazing GDP growth. Um, so one should also be cautious and not say that it's only, it's inevitable again that a period of, of stagnation or decline even would necessarily lead to you know these populist policies, or even the opposite, that a period of, of exceptional economic growth might uh, inevitably kind of be followed by better uh, political policies. So, so I think those are uh, you know the kind of relationship between economics and and politics is is not a it's not an easy one to kind of model certainly. Right, right. Um, we're, we're getting some questions from the audience. Um, Michael McLagan is asking if your work has been influenced by other authors who have written on the topic. He's thinking of, uh, for example, Gerard Diamond. Um, uh, James Robinson, uh, et cetera, um, and you ask, how does your work differ from theirs? Yeah, that's an excellent question. So certainly um, the book is actually reporting on some of the latest research uh, in, the, in my field in African economic history. And of course, you know, Jared Diamond is a big name um, and, and uh, James Robinson actually writes, you know, the shot for the, for the book on the cover. Uh, and, and I've been invited to, to uh, visit him in Chicago. So it's, you know, I've, I've, I have a wonderful relationship with him. Um, and so certainly his work has, has influenced the, um, the, the book. There's a chapter on colonialism. And so I cite him and Leander Heldring's uh, paper on, uh, you know, the effects of the colonial experience. There's a, there's a chapter on um, the kind of uh, 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 Bantu migration uh, at the very start of the book, I think chapters four or five. And, and there uh, it's all about Jared Diamond's work. Um, I guess, uh, you know, there are several other economic historians that are probably less known, lesser known. Their work is lesser known. They published more in, in, in kind of academic journals. And it was important for me to also highlight uh, those contributions. Um, so, so I guess many of us are familiar with these names, uh, you know, the Jared Diamonds, the James, the James Robinsons. But it was also important to kind of to showcase, I think, uh, some of the mo most uh, recent work on, on the topic. Right, right. Great. Um, just a reminder to people out there to please feel free to keep asking questions. Um, I'm going to just ask you a couple more as we're going along. Um, so, like I've said, you don't, you don't really pull any punches. In Chapter 6, you flatly, you flatly say that the late Zulu King and Charlemagne, uh, that what they had in common was feudalism. Um, so do you believe that feudalism is the best way to describe the state of affairs in the former homelands? Yeah, I think I, I would go even beyond that. I would say um, I think there's still a lot of remnants of feudalism. So, so when you teach, you know, second year students and you teach about you know, medieval Europe, it's very difficult to kind of get them excited about history, right? Especially if I, you know, I teach commerce students. So, so why should they care about about history? And so this, the purpose really is to show that you know many of these institutions are still pervasive in society today. And so, you know, you're right that they are feudal uh, legacies, I guess, in South Africa. And so the former homelands is a good example of that. Of course, it's not exactly the same, but the kind of rough uh, 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 format is that you have a, a leader, a king, you know, Charlemagne, uh, 
or Kings Velatini, and he has vassals. Uh, in the olden days, these were would have been the knights. Uh, today, it's like traditional chiefs, and they then have you know servants, or uh, in South Africa, kind of uh, the Zulu uh, um, farmers. Um, and and so property rights are often uh, ill-defined, or certainly ownership uh, rights are are with the with the vassals or with the king. Um, and so it's a similar system in that sense. Um, but I would I would say that you know it's not only um, property rights in terms of of land, but it's also in terms of say the kind of guild system that I think that you know South Africa still, uh, and not only South Africa, many parts of the world still uh, exhibit uh, signs of. So and, and there one could easily go to like the private sector and say, uh, you know, there are various kinds of uh, of pseudo guilds still in society today. So things like you know Saika, for example, I think is an interesting case study of where. It's basically you know, a, a business sector that monopolizes certain operations within society, which is exactly what a guild did in, in medieval Europe. You had a guild of, of shoemakers. Now you have a, a guild of basically of accountants. Um, so uh, you know, those, the point is really to just show that many of those, those institutions, which we think of basically as you know, uh, uh, historical institutions, they certainly persist uh, into the present. OK. Right. As E. H. Carr said, we're having this continuing kind of dialogue with the past. It's one of the things that um, it's one of the yeah, things exactly. that history does. Um, so I'm also I'm going through a couple of other questions here. Um, a Charles from uh, sorry, a question from Charles Yes. I hope I've pronounced uh, the name correctly. Do you think that we're in a, a cyclical period of low growth, or do you think it is structural and it will remain uh, this way for many years? Um. I, w I wouldn't say we're in a, uh, a period of structural low growth. Um, I mean, it, it depends on you know your time horizon, I guess. Um, right. So certainly, obviously, COVID has affected global growth, and and we you know we can attribute that pretty much to to the pandemic and the and the lockdowns. Um, but um, you know, if you take the decade before that, we we see you know certainly in developing countries we still see pretty impressive growth. Maybe maybe in the years or two. Before 2020, not so much, but certainly in the, in the early 2010s, we see we see quite impressive growth in many developing regions. Um, and of course, they uh, we see lower rates of growth typically in you know Western Europe, um, but that's also linked to demographic uh, uh, factors. So so per capita growth is still relatively, I think, um, high. So my sense is that you know if you if you had a shorter time horizon, maybe it's more cyclical given the kind of pandemic. Um, uh, but also then you know we see pretty pretty rapid bounce back this year already. Um, so so I'm not uh, I'm not too worried that um, that we've run into a completely new era of low of low growth. Even though obviously there are scholars that suggest that you know we've we've basically discovered everything we could and you know technological uh, innovation is is seizing to some extent but but i think you know what covid has shown us at least the silver lining is that that's not entirely true we see incredible innovation in the last year or so you know just in the kind of you know biotech domain um, and and with vaccines and the potential of of this mrna technology and what that could do you know for the african continent if if there was something like a vaccine for for malaria and uh, and hiv aids um, I think the potential of those kinds of innovations are just enormous. Um, so, so I'm not too worried about the, a period of, of low structural uh, growth. Right. Um, so I suppose just on that topic, I suppose South Africa's case uniquely may have some structural constraints, right? I mean, um, ESCOM comes to mind and things like that, I suppose. Um, yeah. But moving along, we've got um, Giannis um, Visahi is asking, um, says, points out that uh, Dr. Ramfella, Ramfella had some stating remarks regarding your work. And what's your response to her comments? Yeah, I'll, I'll yeah, also... I'm, I'm, not, I'm not familiar um, with, with her critique, I, I have to admit, so... Yeah, um, so we had a, a book launch, uh, which uh, she was invited to, to host, and then she wrote a review of the book uh, on News24, so that's what I suspect it uh, alludes to. Um, my, I think uh, I'll focus on where we agree. I think we agree on many things. Um, uh, I think um, she mentions, for example, that that uh, I failed to mention many African um, 
uh, episodes of, of growth or episodes of uh, African wealth. Uh, and and I, you know, I think there's a great chapter about Mansa Musa, the 14th, 15th century um, uh, Mali leader. Um, so, I, you know, I don't, I don't think I fail to mention the, the incredible right, the, richest man in, the richest man in history. Right. Exactly. So, so it's a wonderful story, actually. So, so I think there's um, certainly um, uh, things that I that I do include that that um, that perhaps wasn't picked up by her. And then I also think that there are things where I where I do disagree. And and you know, it's it's uh, my work is based, as I said, on on scholarship of the last twenty years. Um, and, and she refers, for example, to a scholar who, uh, who wrote in the 1960s who didn't have access to the kind of modern techniques that, that economic historians and historians more broadly and, and you know, even scholars beyond that field, archaeologists have access to. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it there. I think you know, my, the research that I report uh, should, should speak for itself. So if, if uh, she has factual um, Concerns with some of those scholars, then you know that's not that's not for me to uh, to dispute. That's that's uh, for her to take it up with them. Okay, we got a question here from uh, uh, Tandy uh, Sechashi. Again, sorry if I've mispronounced uh, your name. Um, is asking if your book has covered or looked at the African Free Trade Agreement and economic development or prosperity in Africa or Southern Africa. So kind of leading on, I suppose, from the uh, response uh, you had to the previous question. Yeah. So it doesn't directly deal with the Africa Free Trade Agreement, given that it was signed, you know, uh, or at least uh, uh, became active at the beginning of this year. And and, and I wrote the book uh, last year. Um, but it does kind of deal with many issues around trade and certainly many issues on the African continent. So. So again, you know, one of the things that I do mention in the book, and actually you want to stress because I think that's partly the frustration for me as you know being an African economic historian, and I think many scholars and and certainly you know a more general audience have this view that Africa has always been poor, and 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 Africa is almost kind of you know the stereotypical view that that Africa has has struggled to escape poverty. But actually, you know, a lot of the research that I work on and many of my colleagues uh, try and find innovative sources to uncover historical incomes, historical um, uh, measures of living standards. And what we show is actually in many cases, African uh, societies, and, and you know, if you just to give you a very practical example, in the 1950s, urban workers in many African cities earned wages higher than in many workers, urban workers in Asian cities. And so that suggests that actually, you know, those regions were more affluent than, than what, uh, what was the case in Asia. And I think that, you know, we're, given our perspective, looking back over the last five or so decades, we wouldn't have believed that, uh, at least given the, you know, the kind of conversation that there is uh, about Africa. So, so those kinds of, I think, evidence is really important to put on the table. Um, so it is, the book certainly tries to take a long run view of Africa. And then the question is, of course, so what happened in, since the 1950s and 60s? And so there's a chapter on post-colonial Africa and, you know, what it, what exactly did happen. And there's a chapter on, uh, I think the second to last or the third to last chapter is about what, had, what has happened to Africa since 2000. And so the, the economist kind of claims, you know, Africa is the hopeless con continent in, in, in this cover of a, a 2000 issue. And, and actually, you know, exactly at that moment when they basically printed it, uh, Africa started turning, uh, turning around its fortunes. Um, so, so I think it's really important to deal with those kinds of questions, uh, but from an empirical basis, so with the evidence at hand. Right. Okay. And that certainly has often been the narrative, uh, right? I'm also thinking of others, some other more popular historians in recent decades have kind of written, kind of almost written Africa off, or or tried to explain Africa's relative poverty and underdevelopment, you know, through, through a variety of prisms. Um, but you also have a useful. Um, section one of your chapters where you go through the kind of historiography and then the, and the way this has changed um maybe, maybe you could just talk that to us a yeah bit. sure i mean so obviously we are not the first to think about you know how has africa done in in history so basically the economic history of africa and, and especially after independence uh, so in the 1960s you see this kind of flourishing of scholarship on africa's past and especially not only the colonial period but what happened before of course the the the, frust the frustration sometimes, but also the challenge is that, 
many of these kind of historical sources are not always available or certainly not as easily available as they are for other, reg uh, for other regions. They're, they're not often recorded in the kind of same format and, and, and sometimes the archives are, are hard to read or you know, the, the sources are simply not digitized or transcribed. And so one needs to find innovative ways to, to record the past. And so from the 1960s to 70s onwards, there's been certain schools of thought uh, from the kind of modernization school which had basically the idea that Africa should just copy the blueprint of the West and that will lead to development. Then there was the kind of dependency school, which said, no, actually, that's exactly what Africa should not be doing. Uh, uh, it was the West that actually underdeveloped Africa. That was the idea. And then there was the Marxist school um, and then the postmodernist school. And I think what this book tries to show is that there's, at least since 2000, uh, kind of a renaissance in African economic history, a lot of scholarship on the topic. From the 1980s to 1990s, during this postmodernist era, there was very little done on actually economic history. And so since the 2000s, really, we see this uh, resurgence in interest. Unfortunately, uh, you know, it's, there's a lot of scholarship in Europe and, and the US on Africa. Unfortunately, you know, we, we don't see the same kind of resurgence necessarily in, uh, in Africa or on the continent. Um, and that's partly what I try and do here at, at Stellenbosch and at LEAP, uh, that, that is my research unit, where we, we try and kind of, you know, build uh, resources and, 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 and support students to, to work more on African economic history. Um, and so the approach that we are taking is a far more empirical approach. It's really kind of going back and seeing, can we uncover sources about, you know, in, in, you know quantitative sources typically about uh, living standards in the past and, and what does that tell us? So it's, it's basically asking two kinds of questions. The one is just what happened? Tell us, you know, were living standards high or low? And the second question is the why question. So why did things go wrong or why did they, why were they perhaps, uh, what, what are the kind of uh, persistent effects of, of the slave trade, which I mentioned in the book, for example, or, or why did Europeans try and colonize Africa? You know, if, uh, I think those are some of the fundamental questions where we all perhaps have um, uh, uh, ideas of what might cause it, but ultimately I think they boil down to, and this is what I hope to show in the book, is that they boil down to economic reasons. Um, and um, and the kind of the scholarship that's now developing around this topic is trying to point that out. Right, so what you're saying too is the scholarship around that topic now is developing a more kind of empirical approach. Um, and again, it's, it's, it's come back to the, to E.H. Carr's point, it's it's about uh, this sort of continuous dialogue that historians have with the past. It just keeps, mm. you know, we're, we're, I mean, it's, uh, historians are also a product of, of their generation. You're a product of your generation. The Marxists from the 60s and 70s were products of their generation and that yeah. kind of thing. And we, we're continually refining our, our view of the past um, based, based, on, um, based on our present. Um, yeah, so, well, so maybe I can, I can add two things there. I think that's an excellent yeah. point. And, and the one is that certainly we have a new outlook uh, compared to, say, scholars of the 80s. So if you were writing African economic history in the 80s and 90s, then the question was, why is Africa struggling to catch up, right? Why is Africa not growing? Why is it actually in decline in many countries? And why do you see often uh, you know, these coups, political coups, or, or uh, just like terrible economic policies often? Um, the question since the 2000s really is, is, is informed by the fact that Africa has turned around these fortunes, right? So many African countries are growing at rapid rates. And so the question now is like, is this just cyclical or is this something deeply structural and something that's kind of changed perhaps with the addition of innovation and technology? And, and, so, that's, and so that's the one thing I'll say. And, the, and another thing is that um, we now have new tools as economic historians. So, um, you know, we have access to computing power that we never had. We have, you know, wonderful tools that allows us to to digitize uh, historical records, transcribe them you know, using OCR techniques. Um, and so we can do things that previous generations of economic historians simply couldn't um, at a much lower cost. Um, and so that's, I think, why there is this new interest uh, on the continent. Right. And that was certainly the state of play in the 80s, if I can kind of date myself from the bit of, of uh, African and South African uh, history that I studied in university in the 80s. That was that was the, basically the dominant narrative at the time that you were um, pointing out there. Um, I've got uh, some other questions here. Um, um, Herman Funk is asking, do you think that the pandemic will lead to uh, changes in economic policy? Well, well, now, we're looking, now we're looking yeah. to the future. Yeah, so I, um, 
as I say in the in the book, uh, the last chapter, chapter thirty four, is on the future. And as I say, there one should never predict um, because you can only basically get it wrong. And if you do predict, you should predict far enough so that you're not surviving. Uh, you know, you don't survive to to know whether you were right or wrong. So I shouldn't. I wouldn't. Um, you know, you know, follow my own advice. If I were to predict in the next five or ten years, I should really be predicting for fifty years. That's really what historians are really good at: is to predict far in the future, so they they won't be able to 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 know whether their predictions came came true or not. Uh, <laughs> but I I think it's inevitable that um, that policies will change. I I um, I just I, I think there are um, uh, there's a new way of life. Uh, in many cases, we we've realized that things like this, you know, it's a simple example, but you know, we can have these meetings online, and and that's amazing. Um, so there's efficiency gains that will be had, um, uh, and I think many businesses are also kind of coping with um, uh, with uh, both the challenges, but also the opportunities that this kind of online world uh, offer. Um, but then you have to think about, you know, your question is about policies and. Um, uh, I think there it's it's uh, not inevitable again that there will be changes, that there will be dramatic changes, but I think it's likely that they would be. Um, so uh, what those might be, I think that's that's uh, kind of an open question and, and one could think of many different markets where there would be different kinds of policies. So you could think of like, the labor market. So how do you support people that, that are struggling to, you know, to connect to this online world? Um, perhaps things like, uh, you know, we know that in South Africa, unemployment is a major issue. So how do we think about providing some form of, of support uh, through a basic income grant? Uh, but while you do those kinds of forms of support, perhaps you need to also remove some of the regulations that, that prevent the market from operating efficiently. So um, so one needs to think about those kinds of, of issues. The, obviously, the property market, one can imagine, would, would be heavily affected by something like the pandemic. Uh, you know, transport, all of these, uh, I've mentioned, you know, uh, uh, medical services and, and biotech. Um, so I can imagine that there could be many different um, uh, policy changes. And, uh, but the question is really whether whether that will happen in South Africa and, and, and more broadly. And, and I, I probably shouldn't venture a guess there. Right. OK. Um, I got a question here from Alex uh, Schubert. Um, he's asking, what's your expectation regarding adaptation of um, 4IR, 5IR, cryptocurrencies, democratizing the financial systems, and AI as pragmatic opportunities for African countries to catch up on the developed world? Yeah, I'll, uh, again, that's a question about the future. So let me say something about Africa, perhaps, which I haven't mentioned in, in the previous answers. So, so I think um, Africa has always had a, you know, we've got this huge land mass um, and labor scarcity, basically. That's historically been true, and that's given rise to, as I show in, you know, chapter four or something, yeah. uh, given rise to cultural institutions that that many of them persist uh, to this day. Um, but it also has an effect on trade. So, you know, previously we've mentioned um, uh, this free, free trade agreement. It's just really costly to trade in Africa, given the distance that many of these, you know, manufactured goods uh, or any kind of good really has to travel. Um, so, so there, the switch towards services, I think, would have enormous implications for the continent because instead of now, you know, having to have a container transported from Masiru, you know, in the mountains to, um, you know, anywhere else, either on the continent or outside the continent, it's just too expensive to do that. Um, so, uh, but but with you know fiber, that becomes almost you know costless, um, and so then suddenly Africa gains a competitive advantage in the trade in services. And so, so what are those trading services? I mean, it's, it's, there's kind of many different options, right? So you can think of business process outsourcing, which which already South Africa has a pretty good advantage in. So, call centers and these kinds of things. Of course, they are also now you know open to technological disruption in the face of automation and these kind of things. But, but ultimately, I think those kinds of, you know, architecture services, uh, I've mentioned accounting before. So there's no reason that an accountant based in Lusaka, you know, in the middle of the continent, basically, cannot perform accounting services to, you know, a firm in London at a fraction of the cost than PwC would be able to provide those services. So the accountants would fly into London, perform the audits, fly back to the books, 
and and you've got a much lower cost than than um, certainly what what you would have had um, if you were to pay a local um, auditor. And the same with marketing, the same with logistics, the same with all kinds of uh, services where you can benefit from this uh, online world. So I, I see immense potential there. And of course, the fact that Africa is becoming connected, obviously on mobile, not so much uh, yet um, uh, by other means, means that there are, again, interesting opportunities in the fintech space. We see already quite a lot of fintech innovation on the continent. Um, the, you know, there are many different, again, markets that one could think that would be for, uh, uh, has potential for Africa to disrupt, not only on the continent, services on the continent, but actually outside the continent. And then those trading services become, uh, you know, something that I think we can pin our, our hopes to. But I suppose, too, um, technology and automation um, also inevitably can lead to job losses. Um, you mentioned you, you cover some of this ground in your work. Um, so if I'm just thinking about South Africa, for example, um, you know, I, like I said, I, I'm from Canada. Um, and back home, uh, everybody pumps their own petrol or, or, or gas, as we say, back home, right? Um, so here, I mean, you've got someone pumping your petrol wiping your windows, checking your oil for you. Um, so if, if, if that kind of uh, North American, and I, I guess probably European model for, for uh, petrol stations was to be, uh, was to take root mm -hmm. here, that would automatically throw tens of thousands of people out of mm -hmm. work. And I suppose too, like in the agricultural sector, um, there's increased mechanization. The, the mining sector is increasingly mechanizing. There's also, also health and safety reasons for that. So there is a social benefit that comes from that. But at the same time, it, it is going to lead to job losses um, in, in the short run. Yeah, you're right. I think the, the probably the biggest uh, question of our time is how to manage this process. Um, and so I, you know, I always urge my students that, you know, if, if you are the smartest student in, in high school in matric, then these are the kinds of questions I hope you think about when you go and study, uh, because I think we need smart people to think about uh, the solutions to this. I don't think uh, the solution is to prevent uh, the, this, this technological disruption. That will just kind of slow our pace of convergence to the global economy. So we, we have to accept that there are these uh, technologies both develop abroad, but also you know develop uh, here that will um, perhaps uh, uh, um, force job losses in certain industries and in certain sectors. And, and that might not only be, you know, blue collar workers, as you refer to it, but also, you know, many white collar workers, again, like accountants, you know, legal practitioners, uh, many uh, economists, I, I should add, um, could be threatened by by these uh, new technologies. So, so the question is, how do one uh, adjust? Um, I tend to be uh, given, you know, my view of, of kind of a long run I tend to be optimistic that that the kinds of services again that we uh, will create with the technologies that that become available would simply uh, allow for different kinds of jobs. Um, and I think service sector jobs again, where you interact with people, we've learned I think in the last year um, how awkward it could be to just be in front of a, a Zoom meeting or a or a right. you know kind of. We want the kind of human interaction. And so thinking about types of jobs that will will require that. And I think that will be both at the kind of low end and, and the high skilled end. Um, so, uh, you know, we, we, we want carers and nurses and, and teachers and those kinds of professions uh, and, and, you know, health instructor, uh, instructors and, and all kinds of shifts. So we can kind of think of, of many different uh, professions uh, that that I think will benefit from this, and which doesn't really that can actually benefit from uh, the uh, complementary nature of technology. I think, and that's that's really what one should keep in mind is when you think about a future career, or when we think about future policies that that um, that South Africa kind of implements. It's it's how do we um, use technology in a way that it augments our human capabilities rather than just like substitute it away from it. So your example of you know, petrol attendants, uh, I think that's a great example because why does it persist for so long? It's clearly that there's something within South African uh, psyche or, you know, with, you know, kind of cultural practices or beliefs that where we, where we view that as a great service and we actually demand that service because, you know, you can imagine that if, 
if that wasn't the case, then uh, any any kind of you know profit maximizing uh, petrol uh, uh, or garage owner would have already you know already called the kind of workforce and and made sure that it's only optimized. But yet uh, we still do it. So why why do we still do it? And and it probably is because there is some kind of service that that um, that those attendants provide that 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 we value um, and we're willing to pay the additional fee so that we are provided with that service. And so once you should, I guess, um, see how that also plays out in many of the other sectors um, uh, in the economy. Right. Yeah, pumping petrol, it, pumping your own petrol is actually a bit of a drag, I have to admit. Um, I, I think the only, the only time I've seen it being of an advantage was there was something that was on YouTube recently where a guy was pumping petrol in the U.S. Guys came up and tried to hijack them, so he sprayed them with the petrol. So it's a good anti hijacking um, yeah. <laughs> device. Um, anyway, moving along, um, Jillian Hamilton is asking, um, in the light of climate change and the av availability of materials, how do you feel about degrowth? And I think what she means is obviously about the, about the economies contracting, which just on that issue, just on that note, I'm just going to say, one of my quibbles with your book is that you twice use the term negative growth which I've written about before, I, I, it's one of my pet peeves. I think if there is no growth, don't use the word. You know, if you're losing weight, you don't say you're having negative weight gain. So, That's true. Any, any, right. Yeah, anyway, so, but anyway, so I think what Jillian is getting at is that, um, you know, because of climate change, because of concerns about resources and things like that, um, what do you think about, about the global economy actually shrinking and i guess perhaps she's asking would that uh, have some benefit yeah i'll uh, so there is a big movement um so i i studied in in the netherlands and and already then in the early 2010s the you know i attended conferences on degrowth so I, I i was aware of this movement um from quite early on and certainly in the last two or three years it's gained a lot of you know speed and certainly you know again linked with climate change and concerns about uh, about um, the environment and, 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 and climate change and, and uh, uh, all of those kind of things. So I, I, I guess my uh, response would be twofold. The first is that I, uh, the idea uh, can either be seen as like this romanticized view that we all have to return to some kind of primitive lifestyle. I think, you know, I, think, I, I don't think that that's what you mean and that's what most people mean, but that certainly is a view that is out there. I think the more kind of nuanced view of this is that, well, the rich world should kind of shrink their economies, um, reduce uh, their you know, demands on, on energy and, and plastic and these kind of things and, and allow perhaps the poorer world to kind of catch up. Um, and then we all live, you know, we kind of tackle two of humanity's biggest problems, which is both climate change and, and inequality. Now, you know, there are, there are concerns, I guess, with the second one in the sense that um, firstly, politically, that's almost impossible for me to imagine how that would happen. Like, no American president is going to say, well, Americans, you now have to go back to living on the same GDP per capita level as Costa Rica. So I, I cannot simply see that being implemented politically. But even if, if, even if you could do that, I think it's, uh, and it's a, a incredibly short-sighted policy for the poor world. So if you believe that the poor world, you know, the developing world still needs to grow, which I think we, which I hope that we all believe, right? You, it's, I think it's quite a Eurocentric view to say to the, to the developing world, okay, you have to stop growing because, uh, you know, we're hurting the environment, um, even though, the, you know, the developed world is, is incredibly affluent. Um, so even if you believe that the um, the rich world has to stop growing and the and the kind of developing world should grow, that cannot make that doesn't make economic sense because our growth is dependent on growth in the rich world, right? If if America sneezes, we catch a cold. So if if they were suddenly to cut their GDP per capita by 20, 30, 40 percent, um, that will be devastating for all developing countries because we sell to those countries, right? You can't get rich by selling to yourself. So we have to sell. To grow, to innovate, um, to produce surpluses, to allow us to specialize, the kind of classic economic uh, idea about about innovation and and growth. So, so I think uh, I, to be very blunt, I think the the you know those that uh, propose um, the degrowth 
uh, ideas are, are have a very Eurocentric view of the world. I think it's it's for me it's a it's problematic in the sense that if you were to tell a uh, and individuals that uh, individual that live just above the poverty line that that they should stop growing and that they um, um, you know shouldn't shouldn't live the kind of attain the same living standards as as the rest of the world. Of the world uh, I think that's that's highly problematic. That said, I think one should of course be concerned about the environment. So the question is, how do you then deal with the environment? And there, I think the only alternative is is through smarter growth, right? So. So growth could mean many different things. It could mean consuming more coal, which I think is a terrible idea, or it could be, you know, innovating uh, and and shifting your resource dependence from coal to sun power, right? And so and if we can think of how, right, yeah, right, yeah. So, so if we think of of how in society we, you know, both uh, we encourage the kind of innovation that would make that happen, but also, you know, in government policies to shift. For example, in the South African case, you know, how do we still have a society where we have a, a, a monopoly uh, provision of energy? Right, that's just that's just silly. Um, we should make it accessible, you know, for entrepreneurs to innovate and to uh, provide us with the with the smart growth that I think we need. Right, right. Um, so, and, and just on that on that topic, um. What do episodes of um, since we're talking about economic history here? What do episodes of degrowth uh, suggest about the trend from the past? I mean, what does history tell us? What happens when an economy goes through a sustained period of degrowth? Yeah, yeah, excellent question, and 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 you're right. It's that's almost the kind of the proof of of you know what I've just said is like it's never been the case where you see. A society uh, reducing GDP per capita and um, uh, you know doing having better living standards or, or raising their kind of life expectancy. They, those are all correlated. So I know that there's a huge critique against just using the measure of GDP, um, but GDP right. ultimately still measures a lot of the things that we care about. So it doesn't measure everything, and it, it you know there's a lot of things that it excludes. Uh, but ultimately, GDP is correlated with a lot of other things like that, that we really care about, like uh, life expectancy, uh, like infant mortality, even like happiness. Right. So these things are are highly correlated. Um, and and there's actually several examples in the book uh, where I talk about this kind of um, uh, negative shocks to growth and and the kind of consequences of that. But I think the most uh, the best example probably is. Um, is the one of Argentina. So there's a chapter on Argentina where, at the beginning of the 20th century, Argentina is one of the richest countries in the world, and you know by the end of uh, the century, Argentina is a middle-income uh, uh, country. And so the so why is is what the chapter is about? But clearly, people in Argentina today are um, are not as you know do not have the same kind of uh, living standards compared to the U.S. as they had in 1900 compared to the US, right. right? So so they were almost living at the same level of... of so they, they have a higher living, standard of living now, of course, compared to then. Yeah. But if you yeah. compare them to other countries, they're, they're, they're exactly. long behind. Yeah. Right. yeah. So, I mean, a great example is, is, I mean, they were six times more affluent than Brazil, right? And so today they are far similar living standards. Um, so Brazil caught up with them. They were a much, much more kind of longer life expectancy, lower levels of infant mortality than Chile, for example. And yet today, Chile, having followed a different development model, uh, you know, live long. Chileans live longer, have lower infant mortality, uh, and significantly so compared to uh, Argentinians. Well, uh, there's, uh, there's a question I just want to ask along these lines. So GDP, of course, is a 20th century concept. Um, so when you... Um, so when you look, for example, at the 18th century or the 19th century, um, how do you calculate GDP for for those periods when the concept didn't exist? How, how, how do you extrapolate backwards now? Yeah, it's it's tricky, right? So I, I've done this with my with my former supervisor for South Africa. We constructed GDP all the way back to 1700, right. um, and and there are many different kind of methodological question that one has to to ask and and assumptions that one has to make and you're right it is a concept for the for the 20th century but of of course uh 
you know, what is GDP? It's basically all the value that's produced within a year within a specific uh, country or the borders of a specific uh, country. So, um, so one could take that same kind of definition and try and apply it to, you know, uh, an 1800s uh, Cape Colony, which is what what I did, um, and you know, calculate all the what you think of all the farmers and what they might have been producing. We know what exports were, so we can add that. We know what imports were, so we can deduct that. Um, and we have some sense of what they might have been in terms of investment. So, you know, GDP is consumption, investment, and what the government spent, and, and we get a sense of that through taxation. And so it's ultimately using the kind of methods of today, but trying to find innovative ways of, of calculating it. And, and um, it's not a precise estimate. You can kind of debate about where, you know, whether it's 10% higher or lower. But I think it ultimately is a nice, you know, gives you a nice ballpark figure. Um, and what it certainly shows is that we are much more affluent today than we were in the past, right? So, so I think that's really what the the point of the of the exercise is. And, we much, and we've also had much higher debt levels before. I mean, if you look at the GDP estimates, so you point out in your book that the Cape Colony um, in the late not in the 1880s had the, the public. Uh, uh, Debt to GDP, the public debt to GDP ratio of over two hundred percent. Right now, the ratings agencies are screaming at Tito and Bellini about eighty percent and getting it down, getting it down. Um, but we've had far higher levels of debt before. Um, but why was it not crippling? I wonder. Yeah, I, well, it was to some extent. Um, so yeah. I, I think that's partly it's a really innovative hypothesis uh, that. Um, so we we I've had this former student Abel Guindepi who, who who calculated fiscal outcomes for South Africa basically going for, you know back to the early 19th century all the way to 1910 not for South Africa for the Cape Colony mm -hmm. and and he shows his work shows that the public debt level as you say uh, debt to GDP ratio was you know in some cases above 200 percent it's kind of linked to um, uh, the war of course the Anglo World War. Um, but there's also an earlier episode in the 1880s uh, when there was a kind of financial crash. So that's really when GDP, the denominator, really collapsed. And so, you know, at the same level of debt, but the but the uh, denominator really declined. And so, so you have a much higher debt to GDP ratio. I think the interesting hypothesis is that uh, the Cape Colony, when uh, South African became South Africa became a union, of course, Cape Colony fought on the side of Britain, and so you know, in that sense, was the victor, and the Boer republics were. Uh, had lost the war, uh, but the Cape Colony, given that it had this high level of debt, really had a very poor bargaining position. And so when things like uh, the universal franchise came up, which of course there was a franchise universal or non-racial franchise, I should say, not a universal franchise, when, when the non-racial franchise came up uh, at the end uh, of the 1900s or 1909 uh, uh, before the unification, um, the, the Cape Colony would have probably proposed to say, uh, let's have a non-racial franchise, but because of its high debt levels, it really had a poor bargaining position. And so I had to accept that the Boer Republics you know, had this request of, of no, that should only be the white vote. And, and of course, black and colored individuals in the Cape could still vote for several years afterwards, but it was limited to the Cape. It wasn't universal across South Africa. Uh, and so I think that's, again, why when we think about history and we often attribute it you know, the things that we see, the policies to cultural or, or political factors, often they have their roots in, in the economic. Right, right. Um, just, so just while we're um, on, these, uh, on these questions um, that, I guess, go to the heart of, of some of the, 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 the racial disparities um, that um, um, is still persist in South Africa, Michael Lamont is asking if you have any comments on BEE. It's a, he has a basic question. Yeah. So uh, I, I mean, I'm certainly not an expert. Um, I've had this thesis for a while that PE has been incredibly uh, positive for white South Africans in the sense that it forced many white South Africans to find alternative forms of employment, often in entrepreneurship, that they wouldn't have had to do uh, uh, without PE. Um, but you know, there's very little in the book about BE. I think that's partly that's partly linked to what I mentioned earlier, uh, the labour market regulations. Um, and so I think one should think of how do you provide economic freedoms, right? That's really the ultimate question here. And 
And I think um, that's what you know, more more and more is. exactly. Yeah. So so more and more regulations often impede those freedoms. Um, so there are ways to provide freedoms through the government. Certainly, so I'm not saying there shouldn't be a government. There should certainly be redistribution, but perhaps in a way that is, uh, you know, in some sense uh, apolitical. So one, again, that's why I like something like a, a, a basic income grant because that gives uh, some level of support to everyone. Uh, but then uh, think about regulations. Uh, regulations ultimately, you know, is is kind of a a, a coalition between the government. Uh, and some elite group, right? And so um, I would say, I guess, uh, BE is is a form of that. Whether it was politically necessary um, to have other kinds of policies, you know, that I, I don't know, and perhaps that's true. Uh, but but ultimately, if we want economic freedom, um, I think um, having a, a, a lower level of regulation, but with a perhaps a better level of support, I think would be would be the way to go. Okay, that's interesting. Um, we, um, just going through a couple of the other questions here, just as we're wrapping up. Um, oh, the other thing about debt levels, one of the things that I did when I found out from your book was, was that Britain only in 2015, sorry, six years ago, basically finished paying off the debt it incurred from paying compensation to slaveholders when uh, when emancipation came to the British Empire in the 1830s, um, and I was I was kind of gobsmacked uh, about that. I mean, the, my the response is basically WTF question mark. So I'm just wondering, um, just just while we're kind of on this broad topic, um, I mean, if slaveholders were compensated and the British taxpayers were paying for that until a few years ago. And, and Haiti is another example of this, where maybe a lot of its underdevelopment is from the fact that it incurred a, a debt to compensate slaveholders, and that wasn't paid off until the mid twentieth century. Um, does does that help? Does that help um, support any kind of a case for reparations? And I, I, yeah, I you don't look at that issue specifically in your book. I know, but I'm just um, yeah, yeah. I. Um... So maybe just some context uh, for those who don't know South African history very well. So emancipation occurred in the British Empire in 1834 with, in the Cape Colony, uh, slaves, the formerly enslaved, were free in 1838. So that for four years, basically, the formerly enslaved still had to work as a way to add to the compensation, right? They were paying off the, the, um, the slaveholders. Um, and so compensation was seen as, as a way to... Um, uh, uh, allow basically the political process to happen. So, you know, there was a massive resistance within British Parliament against uh, uh, emancipation. And so compensation was a way to appease those concerns. Um, uh, so then one should keep that in mind. That's obviously not to justify why it happened, but it's it's a way to explain why it happened. Exactly. And so um, you're right in a sense that what, in a, you know, if we can go back, one would want to think of a policy where the formerly enslaved would be uh, compensated and not so much the slaveholders. Um, but it also helps to understand why this process of uh, slavery continued to exist, even though there were a lot of moral concerns against it and religious, of course, concerns against it. But why it persisted basically is because it really underpinned the entire financial system. One sees a lot of the work that we are now doing here is to show how um, you know the, um, slaves were often collateral in debt uh, transactions and credit transactions, um, and so there's a nice chapter I think where I try and highlight uh, this in the book is to show that this is this really was an economic system, uh, not only in terms of kind of labor but in terms of capital. Um, uh, so you know the question about reparations, uh, I think in the U.S. the debate is is uh, obviously. Uh, much more uh, prevalent and and there I think uh, identify so there's a lot of practical concerns or questions about how would one identify kind of the descendants um, here I think it would be uh, even more so uh, given that obviously today's um, formerly enslaved population would predominantly be the colored population uh, of, uh, yeah. of South Africa so so that's that would also be uh, I think a, a very difficult thing to think about. And of course, South Africa has a, a history of dispossession uh, beyond just slavery. It wasn't just that it ended in 1834. We see uh, 
of course, we know the kind of South African history, which ultimately ended with with apartheid. Um, so, so I think the rep the question about reparations in South Africa would be, you know, incredibly difficult, and and uh, would probably go beyond just uh, the emancipation of the of the enslaved. Right. Right. Cool. Um, so uh, just just as we're wrapping up here, uh, a couple of other questions. Um, uh, Benoit Leroy is asking: Is Africa better off now economically when measuring, say, GDP per capita in, in, the, in the various ways that you attempt to um, over the past thousand years in line with the West? Um, he's asking if you talk about the about the impact of colonialism in this period. Um, yeah. I, I so. Um... I think, uh, so I do talk about the period of colonialism and I, I, you know, there's a question about why did it start, but also there's the obvious question about um, what was its consequences. And, um, and so that's actually where I referred to this James Robinson paper, uh, trying to think about what might the counterfactual have been. So that's really ultimately, you know, any kind of social science we want, we want to kind of test, the, empirically test what would be the consequence by having a, you know, treatment group and a control group. So you want you want, in some sense, some countries to be colonized and others not to be colonized. And then you can look at the difference and you can see, OK, well, this was clearly a negative effect or this was, uh, you know, there was little effect or so. But we don't we don't have that in 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 um, in Africa. And so um, uh, it's really difficult to kind of think about the consequences. Uh, but I think what uh, Eldring and, and Robinson show is that constructing thinking about creative ways of constructing a counterfactual they they basically show that if you classify the kind of three types of colonies that were uh created on the continent and and i mean that's that's i should the footnote there is that it's really difficult because there's so many varied experiences of colonization but they construct these three classifications they basically show that each of these three types uh have it have had a negative effect uh you know of, of different order of magnitude but um but certainly there's no, you know, there's no sense that um, that Africa, in, you know, if you want to kind of take a normative perspective, benefited um, uh, from 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 this from a colonial experience. And and we can show that through various ways through GDP is now is the one. But there are but there are other kinds of uh, more perhaps localized um, uh, effects that we can test. So so one of the studies that I mentioned in the book is to show that these borders that were drawn, you know, borders drawn by Europeans that knew very little about the continent, um, ethnicities that are split with these borders. So if you live on the, you know, think of the Tswana who live in both Botswana and South Africa, they are, you know, those types of ethnicities across the continent are more likely to be, to experience periods of violent conflict than, than ethnicities that will not split. And so that's a, that's a more accurate, I think, way of testing what the effects of colonialism was um, it kind of it, you know goes back to the way that social scientists like to think about these um, uh, these research questions and and uh, to me that's that's quite a convincing argument again that they are these persistent effects of of colonialism. Right. Right. Cool. Um, so uh, we're going to wrap up now. Uh, we've got about a minute and a half left, so I don't think I'm going. To, I don't think you've got time to take any more questions um, from the audience now. And I apologize if I wasn't able to for not being able to get to all the all the questions. Um, like I say, um, we we know the the, the book is available. Um, I'll, I'll hold it up again. Um, I say I I, um, I quite enjoyed it. Um, and while I think it was written for perhaps an undergraduate audience, um, you know, somebody who has a master's degree in history from a, a long time ago, and even a crusty old reader like me could um, read it with benefit and, and learn a few things from it. So, and, and like I say, it's important that um, we need more, um, you know, as a journalist who writes about economies, I think we need actually more economic history. Out there and more works on, on economic history. You know, economics is often called the dismal science. Um, but uh, actually, when you get into it, there's nothing dismal about it. It's quite interesting. I think so. Um, anyway, uh, and I don't know if we have a, a little bit. Of, do you have any concluding remarks to make, Johan? Or no, it's it's you know this is. Um, or, I really appreciate the, the time and the, and the questions. I thought they were fascinating. And of course, uh, if anyone has uh, any specific questions that they still want to ask, I, I remain an academic. So I'm always curious about new ideas and, and ways to think about the past. And um, 
uh, I hope readers enjoy the book. Um, and, and thanks also to the Daily Maverick for, for arranging uh, this, this webinar. Okay. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks for joining. Cheers.